operations, well at time at 90 seconds and counting. Houston flight now confirmed that they are go for the flight as are all other aspects of the mission. T-minus one minute, 16 seconds and counting. Pressurization continuing within the vehicle at this time. Liquid hydrogen tank in the second stage now pressurizing. T minus 60 seconds and counting. T minus 60. The status board still shows we're pro at this time. T minus 50 seconds and counting. We have transferred to internal power. The transfer is satisfactory. seconds and counting. We'll count down from starting at T-minus 20. T-minus 25. Stage is reporting ready for launch. T-minus 20, 19, 18, 17, 16. T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is in channel. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, one, zero, all engine running. Lift off, we have a lift off. Greetings, Kerbinauts. This is Cripple Space Program. I'm Bob Fitch, and this is episode number 11 of Project Alexandria, a look at the history of real space flight using real solar system in Kerbal Space Program. It's 1964, and you just watched the Saturn 1 SA-5 launch from Cape Kennedy, which was not the launch site's name last year in 1963. It was called Cape Canaveral then, but President Johnson got it renamed to Cape Kennedy after the former president's assassination. 
However, the name was not very popular in Florida, and in 1973, the site was renamed back to Cape Canaveral. Today is January 29th, which is the same day the Cold War spoof by Stanley Kubrick is being released. It's called Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. I first saw that in 1984. Well, actually, it was the only time I ever saw that. It was a strange movie, but it sure had a memorable ending for me. Anyway, the Saturn 1 Block 2 here is the launch that JFK had predicted would place the United States launch capabilities ahead of the Soviet Union for the very first time. Now, if you look at this graph I made of moon launch capability, it probably looked more like this. So this is my simplified look at what it might have been. You can see Sputnik here launched in 57 right there, and the U.S. didn't cross over that Kármán line right here and put something in orbit until Explorer. However, the slope of the U.S. was going up faster, which is why Kennedy was saying that the Saturn I may have given us the first capability that exceeded the Soviet Union. With that faster slope, that's what put the Saturn V up here in 69, ahead of the Soviet Union, landing on the moon, and then pretty much annihilating any interest in the Soviet landing on the moon, and so that's why their capabilities dropped after that. The U.S. program continued for a few years, and then when that ended, the U.S. capability of landing on the moon dropped down to almost nothing as well. This far more complicated version of the sheet shows what I was talking about right there, where the actual crossover may have been more around here after the United States had carried out some extra Gemini missions in this area, working on orbital activities like rendezvous and spacewalks. The Cold War raged on through all of this, or more accurately because of this. A Soviet newspaper verbally attacked Werner von Braun, calling him a Nazi and claiming he created inhuman working conditions for workers at an underground Nazi rocket base in Poland while working with Adolf Hitler during World War II. We have dropped away stage one and burned out stage two. The payload for this flight was ballast, so we're leaving it attached and thus the whole upper stage is the payload. The test was completed successfully and this launch will eventually deorbit and burn up in 1966. Later in the year, NASA will launch flights number six and number seven, which will be the first two flights to have the command service module attached. I won't be showing those, but those flights are also mostly successful. April 8th, 1964, before the other two Saturn launches of this year, we're testing the first ever of the Gemini spacecraft. This, like all Gemini that will come after it, is being launched on a Titan II missile. The Titan I was an ICBM technically capable of orbital flight, but once you load it with a four-ton nuclear warhead, it becomes suborbital, which was fine for missiles. We need to send four-ton manned payloads into orbit, though, so we're using a modified Titan II. Mission control this time is in Houston, not Florida, which is the first time Houston is being used for flight mission control. We're launching from Cape Kennedy Launch Complex number 19, and all future Gemini missions will launch from here as well. What's really interesting is that Gemini craft were technically more advanced spacecraft than Apollo in many ways. The Saturn launch vehicles and capsule plans have been in development for years now. Apollo was intended to be a series of tests after Mercury and was not intended to go to the moon. Gemini was going to go to the moon after Apollo tests were completed. However, delays in the Apollo program made it clear to NASA that we would not make it to the moon before the end of the decade if we didn't change plans. The time gap between Mercury and Apollo was going to be years, and there was too much space training that still needed to be done. So in 1962, the United States started looking at configurations involving Apollo for moon landing, and Gemini moved to the front of the line as follow-up missions to the Mercury program. The Gemini capsules were even called Mercury Mark II at first, and only later renamed to Gemini. 
Engineers were able to incorporate all their knowledge and learning and all their techniques into Gemini design and construction, making it technically more advanced than Apollo. There were all kinds of plans for how Gemini would be used to go to the moon and land, return, how to deal with safe re-entry and landing. There were even plans for how to make 12-man Gemini missions and space station development. But all those plans were eventually scrapped and Apollo became the moon missions project instead. Our Gemini has made it to orbit. The only problem was it went into a slightly higher orbit than expected. About 270 kilometers was desired, but about 320 was achieved. Perigee was only 160 kilometers, so the drag at Perigee pulled the craft down after only four days. It deorbited over the South Atlantic Ocean. The capsule was not decoupled from the upper stage, so the retro rockets were not tested with this flight. That would occur with Gemini 2, which was supposed to fly in December, but would not actually launch until next year. All in all, there will be a crazy number of firsts throughout the Gemini launches. There will be 12 different flights over about two and a half years of the project. Who would like to take a look at the Saturn and the Gemini in the VAB now? You would, that's right, I just knew it. Okay, let's take away the launch clamps first because that throws off the mass value. There, the clamps are away. I've moved it up a little bit so you can get a good look at it. The bottom section had eight little fins around the outside, but only four of them were big, four, and then four of them were a little bit smaller. So I used a combination of fins on mine as well. The only thing I didn't do was change the color so that one side of this fin would be black while the other side was white. But other than that, it should be pretty close to the original. Down at the bottom, you can see we have eight Apollo H1 engines. I took some engine models out of the FASA pack and I rescaled them and changed their stats so that they would work as my Saturn 1 first stage engines here. FASA has this piece already that you can put on the bottom that the engines can go into. Now one thing I didn't do that I believe the original one did was angle those engines differently. Let me put one of these engines back so I can show you what I'm talking about. Okay, so right here, you can see this. I'm angling it out just a little bit. I believe that the real engines may have been angled just a little bit like that. And then four of them put in here on the outside edge. The four in the middle were straight up and down. You can see that in some of the liftoff pictures. Moving our way up, you can see that what they did was take several tanks that they already had and they put them together to make this middle tank right here rather than trying to create a whole brand new tank all for itself. The only thing I did on this one was modify the texture. I wanted it to say SA5 in United States down the side, so I did that. Also up at the top of it, you can see that this is where I have embedded some of the retro rockets, just like the real one had. One of the more commonly asked questions is how do I get those textures or how do I change the textures? Where are they coming from? So let me show you. I'm using a FASA part in this case. So we're going to go into my game data folder and follow it down to the FASA part that I've modified. Inside the Apollo folder right here, we have a bunch of config files for the different parts, different model files for the parts, as well as the textures for them. To find which model and which texture we're using, we need to know which part. In this case, it's the Lift S1B because it's the Saturn 1. So if we open up that config file, we can see the model being used. Right here, you can see this is the name of the part, so I know I'm in the right place. The model right here says it's the Lift S1B Stage 1 model. So we go back over here and we see the MU file. This is that model for the lower tank. The texture that's going to go along with that is this one down here, this DDS texture, which we're going to load up into a paint program. There, I've got it loaded up, so we'll close that, and you can see this is where it says United States SA5. This isn't what the original texture looked like. Also, DDS textures are going to probably show up upside down for you, so I like to flip them the other direction, and then we can see the actual thing. In this case, there's a lot of translucency in here, so I create an extra layer, and in that layer, I take a color like black or something, and I fill that in in the lower layer to let me see the textures better. At that point, I have access to the area now where it said United States, which you can see is right there. If you zoom in really close to it, you can see what I did. 
there's a line going right down the edge here. It doesn't show up very well in the game, so I didn't worry about it too much. But basically, the original texture had something else that it said on there, like Kerbal States or something. So I went in like this, and I simply deleted out that section. I put in a different texture, such as this one over here. Just do a copy-paste, put that in there, cover it up. You can do that a couple times, cover that back up. And then I took a red color, took the texture, the, the text tool, and then just started typing in United, going down like that. And then down below, I put in States, and then I just moved it to the location where I wanted it. Zoom back out again to get a good look. Oh, I put it in the wrong spot, but you get what I'm trying to say. This needs to be over there. We would just have shift that over there into that spot. So write United States down the side, say SA5 here, change this texture there, take the whole thing, flip it back over again, and then save it out as a DDS texture. That's how I get all of my custom textures. I just go in and I make them with a paint program. Back to the rocket, moving our way up here through the fairing. You can see that I have taken the FASA engines and engine mount and repurposed them, recolored them a little bit, changed all their stats and made them work for my RL10 engines. Six of them down here on the bottom. We also have a camera right there so that we can watch the decoupling, which you saw earlier. There's also some Ullage rockets right here, four of them along the outside. Then we move up into the final stage here, because in this particular instance, this whole thing was just ballast and fuel. The fuel was down here, we have our avionics section right there, and then all of this up here was just nose cone and ballast. There's actually nothing inside there for this first test of the Saturn. Well, really it's the fifth test of the Saturn, but it's the first one that had the working upper stage. So now we will load up the Gemini, pull off the launch clamps, and then go up here so we can take a look at it. For the engine, you can see that I did an Aerojet LR87-7 which was actually originally a KW rocketry engine, but I rescaled it to make it look like the one that I needed. Then we have our fuel tank right here. I modified that one by welding together two tanks to make it look just right. And on the side of it, I put a decal that says the United States. Up here, we have a decoupler that came out of the FASA pack, which reveals another FASA engine that I rescaled in order to make our LR91 engine and if we click on the show engine GUI here you can see that it's the LR91-7 style engine and all the stats that are appropriate to that. Then we have our upper stage here pretty simple we got a fuel tank which moves us into the equipment section of the actual Gemini spacecraft. There are various thrusters for maneuvering all around the outside you can see them all through here. This section contained MMH and NTO for its fuel as well as hydrogen and oxygen in order to power a fuel cell that is not currently on yet. This isn't the Gemini mission that had that, but there will be a Gemini soon, so I've already got that all set up so it's ready. Then there's the retro package section, which we didn't get to see yet, but this is what it's going to look like. There are four retro rockets in there and then various things to support the thrusters that help it maneuver around here on the outside. That will eventually decouple for re-entry, and there's a heat shield down here at the bottom, a nose cone up there, a couple parachutes, regular and drogue chute, and then an RCS section, and that one also has some NTO and MMH in order to power its thrusters. And then finally we have the capsule, where once again I have modified the texture to say United States, and I put a flag on the outside of it. And that's it, so let's go take a, no a look at the next launch. We move ahead to October 12th, 1964, back in the USSR, Baikonur, Kazakhstan, multiple firsts sitting on the launch pad. This is Vaskhod 1, the first of its kind. The Soviets had received news that the Americans were going to launch two men at the same time with their new Gemini capsule. Not to be outdone, they decided to beat the Americans to the punch yet again with a three-man capsule. It was all smoke and mirrors, though, to keep face in the public eye. But no one would discover that fact for many years to come. Instead, the launch of a three-man capsule was seen as yet another blow to the Americans. The reality was that the Soviets were falling behind now in the space race, and they knew it. Delays and politics had left them with no clear plan what to do after Valentina's flight. The Vostok program was receiving budget cuts. The Soyuz program was not ready for manned flights. 
So the need to beat the Americans to a three-man flight meant they needed to rework their Vostok into something that could do the job, and they needed to do it fast. Testing was very limited. Safety precautions were at a minimum. It's amazing this flight and the crew survived when you look at the conditions. Who were the crew? Well, as I said, this was a space flight first for sending up three at once, but the crew included additional firsts. Vladimir Komarov was the commander, and he was military, but a raging political battle between Sergei Korolev and the Air Force was finally won by Korolev when he was able to get two non-military assigned to the flight over the objections of the Air Force. Konstantin Fyaktistov was the flight engineer, non-military, a space flight first. He helped construct this craft with Korolev, and in return, Korolev gave him a seat on the flight. Also on board, we have Boris Yegorov as the flight doctor, another space flight first. They must have been crazy to climb aboard. No offense to my Russian fans, but I'll be honest, we in America sort of have this opinion of the Russians as uh, you're a little bit crazy when it comes to safety. Russian lumber transportation. How to stop traffic, how to jump out of a window into a tree wearing no shirt, how to base jump with a parachute that doesn't open till you hit the ground, tanks on the beach, tanks on your back, and climbing to impossible heights. Yep, you guys are nuts. So it should come as no surprise as we look at the Voskhod 1 to see what it is that the Soviet Union did to it. For starters, to fit three men inside a capsule designed for one man, they needed to remove the ejection seat, so they had no way to eject. If anything had gone wrong, that was it. The Soyuz plans included an ejection tower, but as I said earlier, the Soyuz was not ready for manned flights, so this crew had no escape mechanism. Since they needed to land with the capsule now, a new and barely tested soft landing system was used. They attached retro rockets to the parachute lines to slow the fall at the last second before hitting the ground. Now even without the ejection seat, the capsule was still too cramped to include cosmonauts with spacesuits, so they didn't wear any. That was a first as well, going without spacesuits. The plan was to launch into a low enough orbit that if the normal retro re-entry engines and the backup up on top of the capsule failed, then the orbit would decay naturally from drag after three days. The original capsule had enough life support for one to survive for ten days. So with three inside, they could live for about three days. But the capsule was getting too heavy, so they had to cut back on life support down to two days. That meant if the retros had failed, then they'd be stuck in orbit for one day more than they actually had life support. On top of everything else as they climbed into the capsule, wreckage on the ground from a previous launch failure was visible in the distance from that high up. So that was the last thing they got to see before they climbed in. As for the design of the craft, this started out as a Vostok and the capsule was gutted to make it fit the three. But it got too heavy, so the upper stage of the Soviet Molnia rocket was swapped in to give it enough delta V to make it to orbit with its heavier payload. And to show how politically charged the Soviet Union was at this time, when the crew lifted off, one Soviet leader was in power, but when they landed, a different leader was in power. In the middle of the flight, Khrushchev was forced to step down as Brezhnev had politically outmaneuvered him while the former leader was on vacation. Anyway, ultimately the crew did survive. They circled the Earth for a day before the ground control forced their capsule to re-enter despite the crew asking to stay up longer. Now remember a pilot needed to land with his craft too for it to count as a space flight so when the new parachute line soft landing motors worked and the crew touched down, the Soviet Union finally made its first true space flight. They rolled sideways after landing, so they were hanging there upside down in their capsule, but one by one they unbuckled and dropped down to emerge safe and sound from their journey. The new Soviet leader Brezhnev gave them the customary old school parade and ceremony to celebrate this Soviet accomplishment. 
For my recreation of the event, you can see that we have used our RCS system, which is powered with nitrogen there, to flip ourselves around and point in the right direction so that the retro rocket can fire. Now, if that one didn't work, we would have flipped around again and used the one on the top of the capsule. But as it is, because it did function, we can now decouple the retro package that's on top of the capsule. We are on a trajectory to bring us back down into the atmosphere. Once we no longer need our service module on the bottom, we'll decouple that. That'll deorbit, burning up on its way in and the capsule will come in on its own, just like a Vostok. At this point, the only difference between a Vostok and a Vaschad is we have three people inside this one instead of one. And as I mentioned earlier, re-entry will be the same except at the very end when we're coming down right when we're about to hit the ground. Retro rockets mounted on the parachute lines will slow us down just enough to prevent everybody from suffering serious injuries upon impact. The commander of the flight is fine this time, but sadly in a future flight, his parachute will fail and he will suffer fatal injuries. I don't have any parts that will do retro rockets on parachute lines. I don't think such a thing exists. So you're just going to have to use your imagination this time. November 28th, 1964, Cape Kennedy, Launch Complex 12, the Mariner 4 mission. Now we're heading for Mars. This is a tricky launch because we're leaving an inclined planet to target another inclined planet, lifting off from a non-equatorial launch site that will add an inclination to our initial orbit. But using a calculator tool like Flyby Finder helps a lot for doing that initial math. I have already calculated the inclination I need to leave Earth to make it to Mars with the Delta V that I have on board. I've placed a target dummy in orbit at that inclination, and now, when I launch for real, I can use that target as a reference to make sure I'm going in the proper direction. I just wait for it to pass over the launch site, and then launch and head straight for it. This is a flyby mission. If all goes well, we'll pass by Mars next year, taking and sending back the first pictures of another world from deep space. I'll let you in on a little secret. It will succeed. All does go well, and 22 pictures will be sent back. It took one week to transmit them all because they transferred at a rate of eight and a half bits per second. Compare that to missions today like Curiosity that are about 250,000 times faster. I'll show you one or more of those pictures next episode because by the end of 1964, Mariner 4 had not yet reached Mars. It does its flyby in July of 1965, coming within 10,000 kilometers of the planet. We're still early in the journey right now. The initial stage of an Atlas LV-3 is burning. We'll switch to an Agena D upper stage once we're a little higher. We have three engines blazing at the moment, but remember, this is the rocket that drops away two of those, along with a heat shield engine skirt once we no longer need their thrust. Those engines fall away, leaving a single, lower power, but more efficient engine to take us the rest of the way to Apogee. I get asked a lot if I use realism overhaul. No, I don't, but the stats are similar to if I did and probably even more accurate. Oh, there goes our engine skirt now. Realism Overhaul has lots of engines and tanks, but not everything ever created. There are tons of variations in real life. The Atlas Stage 1 propellant tanks, for example, have gone through more size variations than I care to count. What I do is create each mission I launch to the exact specifications of that one launch. I try to get every detail correct. It takes a lot of research, but that is part of what I enjoy about it. Using realism overhaul for me would be like the difference between downloading a craft file versus building my own ships. 
Cool, there goes our fairing now, so Mariner 4 is getting to see space for the first time. What I need to do next is check our current trajectory to make sure we're still relatively on track with our target dummy vehicle. As I find that we're coming in a little low, I grab a maneuver node for just two seconds, see which way to travel, and then just delete it again and fly by eye. Earlier, we dropped our two LR-89 engines, so only the single LR-105 sustainer engine is running, plus two LR-101 vernier motors on the sides. Those are intentionally weaker engines now than past Atlas launches because we have discovered that we don't need them to be as powerful. They are now producing only about 3 kilonewtons each. The main engine is roughly 380 kilonewtons at this point, and we have burned through almost 95% of our fuel just getting to this point. And we are out. The Agena has separated, and we'll get into position now to make the circularization burn that will place us into our parking orbit. From there, I will figure out what my maneuver node is that's going to take me to Mars. Since I've already calculated the amount of delta V I need, I'm just going to enter slightly less than the proper amount, which is just over 4,000 meters per second. Then I will make slight adjustments using the precise node mod until I get it exactly the way that I want it to get as close as possible for my intercept. We will need a mid-course correction to get the true intercept though, because that is what the real one did, so we're going to simulate that. Now we're in our parking orbit, so it's time for a maneuver node. At first I type 3000 by mistake, but then I fix it to 4000 meters per second. I know I need to add about 200 to 300 more, but I'll do that once I can see Mars on the big map. I'm starting the maneuver right here, but this is not really the starting point. It doesn't really matter where I place it at first, because I'm going to use the precise node mod to shift the starting point around my orbit until I can see an intercept with Mars, or at least a close approach marker. As you can see, I did get an intercept, at least with the maneuver node. Once I fire up the engines, things get a little off track and they burn out without generating an actual intercept. Instead, I get a close approach indicator, which is actually perfect. I needed to do a mid-course correction anyway. That occurred on December 5th, so I'll fast forward in the game to December 5th as well before doing my next maneuver. After burning out the Agena, we'll decouple the payload and extend the solar panels. They'll still be able to generate over 300 watts of power even out further from the sun near Mars. Once they're out, we'll perform another space flight first. We'll use a star tracker to locate the bright star Canopus and begin navigating by using the stars for reference. Mariner 4 itself was created by the Jet Propulsion Laboratories. It had RCS jets mounted on the ends of the solar panels for attitude control plus a weak gyroscope. It had a high-gain parabolic antenna on top, which I created by squishing a normal dish in just one dimension to give it the elliptical shape that I needed. Behind that was an omnidirectional antenna with a helium magnetometer attached to it. Once the panels are out and pointed at the sun, I'll extend that antenna by hand. Down on the body, we have an ionization chamber, Geiger counter, trapped radiation detector, cosmic ray telescope, solar plasma probe, cosmic dust detector, and at the very bottom, a camera to take pictures of Mars once we get there, which I got from the Hull Cam VDS for my replica. There, we're all set to skip forward now to December 5th for the mid-course correction right after we leave Earth's sphere of influence. We'll turn that current close approach into an actual intercept in the next episode, watch as we pass Mars, and in the process, make another discovery. As the probe passes behind Mars, we discover that it has a thin atmosphere. They're able to figure this out by sending radio signals through the air just as it passes behind Mars. The air alters the signal, which would not happen if there were no atmosphere, and thus there must be one. For the mid-course correction, I'll use precise node once again, jiggling around the node with tiny delta V increments until I can get the projected orbit within 10,000 kilometers of the planet, just like the real Mariner 4. Once that's set up, I'll switch my control from the main Mariner 4 probe body to a radially attached probe that I placed opposite the engine. Mariner 4 had a 222 Newton hydrazine monopropellant engine mounted on its side. 
By placing a radial probe core opposite the engine, it makes it quite easy for me to do my maneuvers in KSP. The astute observers among you may be thinking, hey, what happened to Mariner 3? I remember you doing Mariner 2 to Venus. So what's with 3? Well, two weeks before Mariner 4, there was a Mariner 3 launch. The fairing failed to open, so yeah, that was that. But as always, you have to have a backup ready, and so here we are two weeks later sending up our backup, and this time with far more success. Now before we end the episode, let's cover one more thing that I'm not going to be able to launch, but it's the first Italian satellite. They built San Marco 1, then shipped it to the United States for launch on a scout rocket from Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia. After this, they built out their own launch site though, the San Marco Launch Platform off the coast of Africa. A scout is an all-solid launcher for very small payloads. And San Marco 1 was quite small, its mass was just 115 kilograms. While technically capable of a little science of its own, it had an ion probe to study the effect of the ionosphere on long-range communications, San Marco 1 was really more of a test run. It was the first of five planned launches, and with it, the Italians were gaining the extra insights they needed to complete the San Marco program, which was primarily to be accomplished with flights 3, 4, and 5. It was launched 10 days after our Mariner 4 mid-course correction, and its orbit will destructively decay next year. Okay, that is going to do it for 1964. Until next time, I will see you later, Kerbinauts.